On behalf of the University of St. Thomas, our board of directors, thank you very much for joining us this evening. What a wonderful way to start the academic year. I'm very happy that uh, we have such a distinguished guest who has come to uh, talk to our students, our faculty, our guests. I'll let John Hittinger uh, do the formal introduction with the center on our behalf. And Mary Ann, my family, so I want to thank you so very much for joining us this evening. here at the university is to reach out to different groups who share the same basic values that we do. So I'm very glad that we have a lot of guests here from Houston Baptist University, from uh, St. George's uh, Orthodox Church that have joined us. Let's give them a round of hand because they help. Also I'd like to thank uh, the individual who has been a long time supporter of this university, whose family has been a supporter of this university, and has helped bring this form to life, uh, Mr. George Strait. <laughs> and last, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. John Hitcher for working so hard to bring the center to here. Thank you, John. And with that, please, uh, former ado, uh, introduce the center. Thank, thank you. you. Good evening, everyone. It is my honor to have uh, Senator Santorum be um, a guest of the John Paul II Forum. I was sharing with folks at dinner that um, Archbishop Chaput, who came and spoke at Houston Baptist, co-sponsored with HBU and the John Paul II Forum, um, gave a strong recommendation to Senator Santorum that he come visit us in Houston. And I'm so glad he's come to make this visit to talk about the Kennedy speech whose 50th anniversary is the 12th of September. And so it, it is an occasion, I think, to recall how faith has fared in this country. We've always been a strong country of faith, and um, Senator Santorum has really taken the lead in his public life to work with all different groups, but also to take the stand for those common values, particularly the pro-life stand, the pro-family stand, and he has um, been a very good spokesman for that. He served in the House from 1991 to 1995 and the U.S. Senate from 1995 to 2007. He's worked on significant legislation and he's been one who has made a real effort to be faithful to his principles and to be consistent in how he presents those principles. And I think for that reason alone, he is very well qualified to come to speak to us tonight from a man who's a practitioner of politics, who has seen it inside and out, and uh, I think has some very valuable things to share with us about the John F. Kennedy speech 50 years later. So please join with me in welcoming Senator Rick Santorum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hittinger, and I want to thank you and um, the John Paul II Forum for, um, for inviting me here and for hosting me today and for showing me the campus, this beautiful campus, and. It is a real pleasure to be here at St. Thomas, uh, a faithful Catholic institution that is uh, standing against the tide uh, in the educational world. I, it is an honor to be here. It's, uh, uh, I wanted to, uh, to give this speech at a place that uh, I felt comfortable, and I feel comfortable here at St. Thomas. And I want to thank Bob and Marianne Ivany, uh, who I've known for, uh, for many years. They, um, uh, Bob was the superintendent at the uh, Army War College in Pennsylvania, Carlisle, and had the privilege of uh, spending some time with him. And uh, it, is, uh, it is a pleasure to see him and doing well here in Houston. And uh, he tells me he's a big fan and he's never going to leave. I don't know. But uh, that's, that's, uh, it's great to be here. And I, too, want to thank uh, the um, uh, Houston Baptists and 
Uh, as, uh, as Dr. Hittinger said, uh, the, um, the speech that Archbishop Chaput gave was uh, planted the seed in me to, uh, to think about how I could um, maybe give a little different perspective on, on, that, uh, on that very important speech from the standpoint, as uh, Dr. Hittinger said, from a practitioner. So I want to thank Houston Baptist for joining us and, of course, my colleagues at uh, Ethics and Public Policy where I do my thinking. It's a think tank, so you do your thinking at the think tank, and so I'm, I want to thank them for for their support in uh, in in, um, in preparing and working on this speech. Um, when I was uh, a young man, three pictures hung in the home of my devoutly Catholic immigrant grandparents, and I remember them very well: Jesus, Pope Paul VI, and John F. Kennedy. <laughs> the president was to Catholic families a great source of pride and a symbol that all barriers had finally been broken. What my family and maybe even candidate Kennedy at the time didn't realize was that in a key moment in that election of 1960, right here in Houston, then candidate Kennedy began the construction of another, even more threatening wall for our society one that sealed off informal moral wisdom into a realm of non-rational beliefs that have no legitimate role in public discourse. Fifty years ago this Sunday, JFK delivered a speech to the Greater Houston Ministerial Association to dispel suspicions about the role the papacy might play in the government of this country under his administration. Let's make no mistake about it, President Kennedy was addressing a real issue at the time, Prejudice against Catholics threatened to cost him in the election. But on that day, John F. Kennedy chose not to just dispel fear. He chose to expel faith. Let me quote from the beginning of Kennedy's speech. I believe in America where the separation of church and state is absolute. The idea of strict or absolute separation of church and state is not and never was the American model. It's a model that's used in countries like France and until recently Turkey, but it found little support here in America until it was introduced into the public discourse by Justice Hugo Black in the case of Everson versus the Board of Education in 1947. Justice Black, by the way, was a Catholic-hating former member of the KKK who, ironically enough, advocated this strict separation doctrine to keep public funds from Catholic schools. While the phrase separation of church and state doesn't appear in the Constitution, the concept of keeping the government apart from religion does. The first part of the First Amendment prohibits the federal government from establishing a state church, such as existed in England and in some of the states in 1791, and from discriminating for or against particular faiths. The founders were determined to ensure that the new national government had no jurisdiction over matters of religion in large part to ensure that each American would be free to pursue the religion of their choice without state interference. Far from reflecting hostility toward religion, our founders, rooted in their own faith convictions, knew that faith was not just an essential element, but the essence of civilization and the inspiration of culture. The second reference to religion in the First Amendment guaranteed the free exercise of religion and in conjunction with the prohibition on established churches, these two concepts were to work together to ensure that religion and people of faith had powerful constitutional protections of their right not only to worship as their conscience dictated, but to be free to bring their religiously informed moral convictions into the public discourse. The phrase wall of separation used by black comes from a letter written by a founder who didn't even attend the Constitutional Convention, Thomas Jefferson. After he was elected president, he mentioned the phrase in a response to a letter written to him by the Danbury Baptists. The Baptist had expressed concern to him about the right of the government to interfere with the religious pursuits of the people, not the rights of the people to engage their government with religiously informed moral judgments. Jefferson's wall of separation was describing how the First Amendment was designed to protect churches from the government and nothing more. Note 
that the Sunday following the day that he wrote that letter, he wrote it on a Friday, Jefferson attended religious services in the Capitol building. So much for the founders' hostility or indifference to religion. But Kennedy's misuse of the phrase constructed a high barrier that ultimately would keep religious convictions out of politics in a place where our founders had intended just the opposite. Kennedy continued in his speech where he said, I believe in an America where no Catholic prelate would tell the president, should he be Catholic, how to act, where no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy from the Pope, the National Council of Churches, or any other ecclesiastical source, where no religious body seeks to impose its will directly or indirectly on the general populace or the public acts of its officials. Well, of course, no religious body should impose its will on the public or public officials, but that was not the issue then, and it's not the issue now. The issue is one that every diverse civilization like America has to deal with. How do we best live with our differences? Our founders' vision, unlike the French vision, was to give every belief and every believer and non-believer alike a place at the table in the public square. Madison referred to this equal and complete liberty as the true remedy. Admittedly, our country hadn't always lived up to that ideal, in particular with respect to Jews and Catholics, thus the legitimate reason for Kennedy's speech. But what JFK advocated sounded more like Ataturk than Madison, that religious ideas and actors were not welcome in the public debates. Ultimately, Kennedy's attempt to reassure Protestants that the Catholic Church would not control the government and suborn its independence he advanced a philosophy of strict separation that would create a purely secular public square cleansed of all religious wisdom and the voices of religious people of all faiths. He laid the foundation for attacks on religious freedom and the freedom of speech by the secular left and its political arms like the ACLU and the people for the American way. This has and will continue to create dissension and division in this country, as people of faith increasingly feel like second-class citizens. Kennedy took words written to protect religion from the government and used them to protect the government from religion. It worked. In the years following this speech, the concept of absolute separation of church and state gained wider and wider acceptance, due in part to its inculcation in the academy. When I was in the Senate, I used to question student groups by asking them which phrase appears in the Constitution, separation of church and state or the free exercise of religion. Separation always won, and usually by a wide margin. Another consequence of his speech is the debasement of our First Amendment right of religious freedom. Of all the great and necessary freedoms listed in the First Amendment, Freedom to exercise religion, not just to believe, but to live out that belief, is the most important. Before freedom of speech, before freedom of the press, before freedom of assembly, before freedom to petition your government for redress of grievances, before all others, this freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, is the trunk from which all other branches of freedom on our great tree of liberty get their life. Cut down the trunk, and the tree of liberty will die. And in its place, there will only be the barren earth of tyranny. This first freedom has now been placed on the lowest rung of interest to be considered when weighing rights one against the other. The fruits of this misguided idea are increasingly evident. For example, the ACLU is currently pushing the Department of Health and Human Services to force Catholic hospitals to perform abortions under the emergency care mandate of Obamacare. The University of Illinois hired a professor to teach classes on Catholic doctrine and was fired because he taught, well, Catholic doctrine. Religious organizations are increasingly excluded from public universities unless they deny their deeply held religious beliefs. 
This year, the Supreme Court affirmed the Christian Legal Society can be barred from the Hastings College of Law because they insist on holding their leaders, like, leaders accountable to the Christian standards of sexual ethics. In 2006, Catholic Charities of Boston was forced to abandon adoptions due to a state law requiring that they assist homosexuals in adopting children, and there are more. Kennedy's error also unleashed a new form of censorship that would make vows to the Almighty a constitutional offense, rob clergy of their First Amendment rights, and deprive our leaders and our country of their inspired wisdom and guidance. When I served in the U.S. Senate, I often looked to the moral wisdom found in the writings of such religious figures of Augustine, Teresa of Avila, Thomas Aquinas, and Thomas More, as well as from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther King, and Rabbi Abraham Joseph Herschel. Mother Teresa's speech at the National Prayer Breakfast, spoken with a humility that made her quiet voice a loud alarm in our hearts, moved me to take a leading role in an issue that pulled at the moral fabric of our country, partial birth abortion. And it was Pope John Paul II and other Christian leaders' call for the biblical concept of absolving debt at the Jubilee year of 2000 that motivated me to join Senator Joe Biden to reduce third world debt. Should I have rejected the instruction from the clergy to, re to relieve debt because it was inspired by the word of God? Did Kennedy reject desegregation because black ministers like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, arguing from a biblical perspective, advocated it? Thank goodness he didn't. There's a long list of Americans moved by faith who took on great causes for a nation they love. Harriet Beecher Stowe, whose novel Uncle Tom's Cabin shook a nation to war. Jeremiah Everett, who defended American Indian rights. Susan B. Anthony, who was inspired by Jesus' radical view of women as equal to men. What would our nation look like had the Spirit not moved in them? If there were any doubts about Kennedy's intent to devalue faith's role in shaping public discourse, his concluding words erased it. He said, whatever issue should come before me as president, if I should be elected on birth control, divorce, censorship, gambling, or any other subject, I will make my decision in accordance with what my conscience tells me to be in the national interest and without regard to outside religious pressure or dictates. So, pressures or dictates from labor unions and environmental groups are smiled upon, and only the religious ones see a frown. To justify this suspicion toward the legitimate claims of faith, notice that Kennedy and his subsequent followers have invoked their conscience as their guide. All well and good. I too use my conscience as a guide. But you are not born with a competent conscience. It is formed, and it continues to be formed, by something and reflects that formation. If faith in objective and eternal truth is no longer going to inform your conscience what moral code will. And where does that code come from? And what is the basis of its authority? Doesn't the public have a right to know? Yet Kennedy's followers never tell us. What they do tell us is clear, that their consciences are not rooted in faith. And as such, they can be permitted to freely apply their ideas in making laws and deciding cases. On the other hand, consciences rooted in a belief in God are free to apply their ideas to personal matters. But if your beliefs, in the words of my former Senate colleague Chuck Schumer of New York, are deeply held beliefs that impact your public positions, they must be excluded. Writing in the 19th century, whose conflicts were prelude to ours, John Henry Newman said, conscience has rights because it has duties. But in this age, it is the very right and freedom of conscience to be independent of unseen obligations. It becomes a license to take up any or no religion, to boast of being above all religions, and to be an impartial critic of each of them. Without some objective moral touchstone, conscience is no more than self-indulgence. I can do what I want simply because my conscience tells me I can do it. 
A major political offshoot of Kennedy's philosophy, sometimes referred to as the privatization of faith, was best illustrated by Mario Cuomo's speech at Notre Dame on another September day in 1984. There he espoused his nuanced position on abortion, that as a result of his religious convictions, he was personally opposed to abortion. But he then applies Kennedy's thesis and refrains from imposing his values upon others whose views, because the truth is indiscernible, are equally valid. A virtual stampede of self-proclaimed Catholic politicians followed Cuomo into the seemingly safe harbor and remain there today. This political hand-washing made it easier for Catholics to be in public life but it also made it harder for Catholics to be Catholic in public life. Cuomo's safe harbor is nothing more than a camouflage for the faint of heart, a cynical sanctuary for concealing true convictions from the public and for rationalizing a reluctance to defend them. Kennedy, Cuomo, and their modern-day disciples on the secular left would resolve any conflict between religion and politics by relegating faith to the closet. I see it as a different thing, a healthy tension that Jesus dealt with directly when he said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar and unto God what is God's. The early church under Pope Galatius pronounced the two swords doctrine, defining two realms, the realm of the sacred and the realm of the secular. Our founders understood that the secular realm of positive law would at times be unjust. And that's why the more important sacred realm would arm people, as one of our founders, James Wilson, put it, with a principle of revolution to strive to set things right. As a senator, whenever I confronted an immoral law that was unjust or harmed society, I had an obligation to respect that law but an equal obligation to work toward changing it, to comport with what is moral. I agree with the founders that there is a natural law which can be known through the exercise of reason against which the positive or civil law must be measured and, if needed, amended. Martin Luther King laid out his approach for ordinary citizens in a letter from the Birmingham jail. He wrote, There are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. That said, it's important to exercise prudence in such matters, particularly concerning matters of personal private behavior. Not all immoral conduct should be illegal. There are many good reasons not to fight such behavior with the coercive tools of the criminal law. With the common sense of his classical tradition, Thomas Aquinas said that law does not forbid all the vices from which upright men can keep away but only those grave ones which the average man can avoid, and chiefly those which do harm to others and have to be stopped if human society is to be maintained, such as murder and theft and so forth. So as long as this immoral behavior is not done in public or has significant public consequence, it should stand outside the civil sanction. Aquinas was clear and practical when he said, the purpose of human law is to bring people to virtue, not suddenly, but step by step. An illustration of this dichotomy is the issue of laws pertaining to certain sexual practices in what is called same-sex marriage. In 2003, I expressed concern about the court's decision in a case challenging a Texas sodomy statute. I did so not because I would have voted for the Texas law, Following St. Thomas's wisdom, I would have opposed the Texas law. I raised concern about the consequences of the legal reasoning the court gave for invalidating the statute. 
they created a new constitutional right to consensual sexual activity. I warned such a right would be used as a basis to create a new right that could have profound public consequences, same-sex marriage. I've been criticized in the media for daring to speak out on this and other sensitive moral issues of the day. So be it. I've tried, not always successfully, to approach these issues with the appropriate passion for the important matters at hand, with respect for the other's point of view, without malice toward my opponent, and with the humility that my judgment in some cases may be an error. As it has been pointed out to me on numerous occasions, there are moral issues where I have differed from the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops and even the Pope, welfare reform, the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, and on some immigration policies. While all of these issues have profound moral underpinnings, none of them involve moral absolutes. War is not always unjust. Government aid is not always just or loving. The bishops and I may disagree on such prudential matters, but as with all people of goodwill with whom I disagree, I have an obligation to them and to my country to listen to their perspective and perform a healthy reexamination of my own position. Let me be clear, I am not here arguing that I have or the country should be governed on the basis of religious revelation. That we should, for example, have laws against murder, stealing, abortion, and polygamy only because the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob decreed it so. I wholeheartedly agree with C.S. Lewis who said, I love God, but I detest theocracies. Obviously, not everyone shares the Judeo-Christian moral convictions. All of us have an obligation to justify our positions based upon something that is accessible to everyone, irrespective of their religious tenets. We owe the public arguments based upon reason grounded in truth. In his encyclical Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason, Pope John Paul II wrote as his opening sentence, Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. And God has placed in the human heart the desire to know the truth, in a word, to know himself. So that by knowing and loving God, men and women can come to the fullness of the truth about themselves. The principle of the harmony of faith and reason is a crucial contribution that the church brings to the debate. Those of us who are Catholics, along with the majority of Protestants and Jews, believe that God reveals himself through his creation, and as such, moral truths that should govern a just society are accessible to all believers and non-believers alike. At the same time, of course, we must hold fast to our conviction of what is right and what is wrong, according to our faith, and not fall into the trap of idolizing our own intellects or trying so hard not to offend that we succumb to watery political correctness. It should not make us uncomfortable to call something evil, if that's what it is. Having convictions doesn't mean that we don't understand the complexity of the world. It means that we're able to prioritize the pursuit of truth and justice and call evil what it is. Our American civilization has reflected a most healthy union of faith and reason. From long experience, we know that faith, for its own sake, apart from love of truth, is only a sentiment. And that reason, for its own sake, withers into rationalism. Neither is autonomous. If we have faith only in myself, I belong to a very small religion. And for the right, uh, and for the right use of reason, Let's remember what G.K. Chesterton said. A madman is not the man who has lost his reason. The madman is the man who has lost everything but his reason. In, Regens in his Regensburg address, Pope Benedict XVI contrasted the Judeo-Christian revelation with the concept of a God held by some outside of the Judeo-Christian world as aloof from reason. He also discussed these societies which would attempt to live without God, as in secular Europe 
or communist China. In the secular West, he said, quote, the subjective conscience becomes the sole arbiter of what is ethical. In this way, though, ethics and religion lose their power to create a community and to become and become a completely personal matter. This is a dangerous state of affairs for humanity, as we see from the disturbing pathologies of religion and reason, which necessarily erupt when reason is so reduced that question of religion and ethics no longer concern it. The movement in our country to fly on one wing, reason alone, will ultimately undermine the very foundation of our country, freedom. America is rooted in the Founders' belief that free people whose God-given rights are protected by a government that allows the individual to pursue their dreams and reap the fruits of their labor would build the most just and prosperous society in the history of man. They were right. Freedom was the key ingredient in the American experience. Our Founders understood that it was relatively easy to establish freedom in our Constitution. The harder task was to create a system that would maintain it against the corrosive force of time. The author, author Oz Guinness describes how they accomplished this as the golden triangle of faith. That golden triangle is that freedom requires virtue, Virtue requires faith, and faith requires freedom, and around again. That freedom requires virtue was explained by the political philosopher Edmund Burke, who wrote, Men are qualified for civil liberty in exact proportion to their disposition to put moral chains upon their own appetites. Society cannot exist unless the controlling power upon will an appetite be placed somewhere. And the less of it there is within, the more there must be without. It is ordained in the internal constitution of things that men of intemperate minds cannot be free. Their passions forge their fetters. On the second element, virtue requires faith. Virtue requires faith because faith is the primary teacher of morality. That's not to say that one cannot be virtuous without faith. But for society as a whole, faith is the indispensable agent of virtue. Faith requires freedom, the third aspect. Why has America remained a deeply religious country averting the road to secularism traveled by our European brothers and sisters? Again, Madison's true remedy the combination of free exercise of religion and no religious state supported monopoly has created a vibrant marketplace of religions extolling everywhere the word of God to inspire people to fulfill his special plan for them and for each of us in our lives. Our founders inspired brilliance created a paradigm that has given America the best chance of any civilization in the history of man to endure the test of time. Time, this time, now in American history, is putting that to the test. I will conclude with a final consequence of what started here 50 years ago by bringing in one of the Catholic Church's foremost American advocates for religious freedom, John Courtney Murray. He advised us that the first two articles of the First Amendment are not articles of faith, but articles of peace. What was Murray getting at? Our motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. Our founders believed that if they fostered religion and the Judeo-Christian moral code, we could achieve something that has never been seen in any country with so many competing faiths, a truly tolerant, democratic, and our home harmonious public square. On June 12, 1775, Congress' first act was to urge a national day of prayer, excuse me, national day of public humiliation, fasting, and prayer. 
for which it commissioned ministers of the gospel of all denominations to participate. On the assigned day, Congress attended services at an Anglican church in the morning and a Presbyterian meeting house in the afternoon. The following year, they convened at Philadelphia's Roman Chapel and later a Dutch Lutheran church. This is the vision, a vibrant, fully clothed public square, a marketplace of believers and non-believers where truth could be proffered and reasoned and differences civilly tolerated. One of my favorite sayings is, we don't appreciate what we have until it's gone. For over 200 years, we have been blessed with a country often described as a melting pot. That fire, the fire that helped to gently melt us together into a country where people of different faiths and cultures come together in our dynamic democracy to peaceably find common ground is that first freedom, the true remedy, freedom of conscience. What the moment spawned here 50 years ago seems to disregard is that repressing or banishing people of faith from having a say in government creates alienation, which could lead to disaffection and conflict as we have seen in other countries around the world. Think about all of the people in this country from different cultures who, if they lived in their native country, would be sworn enemies. But yet, when they come to America, they're inoculated with something that enables them to work together on the school board or in neighborhood associations. A key ingredient in that inoculation is the freedom of conscience that ameliorates the fear, frustration, and mistrust that comes from repression. Kennedy's speech was historic because it did offer a teachable moment. In the short term, it accomplished a great good by helping to put an end to Catholic bigotry. Unfortunately, its lasting impact not only undermined the essential role that faith has successfully played in America, but it reduced religion to mere personal belief and helped launch a cultural revolution, proclaiming loudly that on matters of moral consequence, reason has no truths it can discern, nothing of moral significance, can claim, moral significance it can claim to know, much less contribute to the public debate. That's the faith, that's the faith that's being offered by those who want to change the time-tested golden triangle of freedom. You'll see it in the public square today, and it's popular because it intends to impose nobody's values on anybody. Yet it's an illusion because it's a, it, is, it uses a cloak of neutrality, objectivity, rationality, that results in the imposition of secular values on everybody while marginalizing faith and those who believe as moralizing theocrats. Kennedy concluded his speech in Houston by saying he did not intend to disavow either my views or my church in order to win this election. The sad fact is he could have stood by his beliefs and won, but he chose not to. Instead, he charted a course that has won many elections, but has put American civilization at risk. I've always felt comfortable to be on the path our founders took, the one that is now less traveled and invites the most criticism. I do so because I believe we all have an obligation to be good stewards of this great inheritance that generations of Americans created with their last full measure of devotion. That's why each and every one of us should feel so blessed to be here at this time. A time when our land that God has so richly blessed is being put to the test. Many generations are never called to do great things or make great sacrifices to maintain liberty. We are fortunate. We are fortunate to be the ones who have the opportunity to not only preserve, but to build on our founder's vision of freedom, supported by virtue, which in turn is supported by a vibrant faith, a mutually strengthening interface of church and state 
that our collective effort will keep America that beacon of hope, that shining city on the hill. May God bless you, and may God continue to bless America. Given the, uh, the attitude to its Catholicism uh, when Kennedy was running, uh, just curious why you think he would have won. Do you really think he would have won if he had stuck to his principles? He could have very clearly said that, you know, he is not going to be, you know, adv advising the Pope. That was the, the concern, that the Pope would somehow be pulling strings. But that he was going to live by his faith convictions on moral teachings which, by the way, are shared broadly with the Christian community. I mean, I can tell you, when I am out there fighting the, the great moral issues of the day, I do so with people of all faiths. So he could have stood up and said, look, the Pope is not going to dictate how I do things. And I say the same thing. The Pope is not going to tell me how to do things. But my conscience, informed by my faith, which I believe in, is a very important part of the decisions I will make. It, it will be the filter by which I look at things. It's the filter by which we all look at things. But he didn't do that. Uh, he took a very, in my opinion, radical approach. Yes? A uh, quick uh, comment. Uh, we now know, of course, uh, thanks to a new autobiography, uh, memoir by Archbishop Philip Hannon, um, who is the Auxiliary Bishop of Washington and Auxiliary, uh, Archbishop Emeritus of um, New Orleans, that uh, Kennedy was indeed taking uh, advice from, Arch from then Bishop Hannon. Uh, Hannon apparently had had the speech run by him uh, that, that Kennedy gave in Houston, um, but uh, Hannon says in the book that he regrets that Kennedy didn't, uh, he disagreed with Kennedy and he regrets that Kennedy didn't take him up on that. Um, Another just quick point, uh, I, I tend to think that um, religion is, is still vibrant in the public square, especially in the last couple of years. I mean, if you just look at the, the, the recent news cycle, um, what are the two, some of the major issues that we've been talking about? We've been talking about this mosque and, and Ground Zero. That's a, a very much of a religious debate that's going on. Um, and uh, also, you know, Mr. Beck's uh, restoring the honor rally, a display of civil religion. Uh, I think that um, that maybe at least we're still things are not maybe as as gloomy as as, as we think because we're still having this conversation. Uh, we're still having this conversation. We're having rallies because of the threat that is in our institutions, our governmental institutions, the courts in particular, um, in Congress. I mean, I quoted one of my colleagues, Chuck Schumer. I mean, um, people. I mean, I can tell you that. It's very hard to get appointed and confirmed a federal judge uh, if you have deeply held religious beliefs. Uh, so when I talk about the public square, I don't mean that people can't get up and say what they want to say. I'm saying in the places where decisions are made, uh, then those types of, uh, of points of view informed by faith are considered invalid uh, and inappropriate. And, uh, and as I said, this false objectivity is supposed to replace it and it's a lie there is no such thing everybody comes with a conscience that's formed by something and um, people who are believers stand up many stand up and tell you exactly they are honest with the American public I mean one of the things that I've been criticized with oh you know this guy just you know he's a theocrat he just no I'm honest I tell you where I'm coming from I'm telling you you know look if you want to see what's formed my conscience here 2,000 years of writings take a look you can if you want to have any questions take a look you know look at look at the look at the Bible look that's what forms my that, that's a big part of now obviously there are other things that form too but as far as the moral code the basics the principles that's where they come from and uh, 
for politicians to say, nope, I'm going to, you know, that's, that's, I'm not going to, I'm not doing that. I'm going to be my own man, my own conscience. What's that mean? It, 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 it's, it's meaningless unless you're honest about where, where you come from, where you're coming from. And it's, that's why I said at this, at the end of the speech, it's a great deception. Um, given the uh, emphasis you've been placing on the public being able to affect uh, the decisions made by the government, on the converse, what areas would you say uh, the First Amendment would legitimately um, not cover? Uh, what, what areas would the government be able to restrict religion? I guess I'm thinking um, we have in England cases where you have Sharia law being pushed in certain neighborhoods. There's a push here to uh, reverence the mosque issue earlier. Um, obviously, I think this. Look, I mean, one of, one of the areas that I worked on when I was in the United States Senate was uh, religion in the workplace. And there's a balancing. I mean, you can't go in and, um, if, you know, if you're a healthcare worker and, uh, you know, you have certain sanitary things that you have to be able to, to comply with. Well, the fact that you are wearing, you have a beard because your religion requires that and you don't want to cover your beard because your religion says you can't. Well, then you can't work there. Because there's certain that there is a balancing, and and I'm not suggesting that you know the First Amendment trumps everything all the time, uh, but what I'm saying is that it's a there's there's a legitimate uh, a, a legitimate balancing and that and that great deference has to be given to religious as opposed to what we see here, which is it's sort of at the bottom of the rung. I mean, it's sort of any old thing trumps religion as far as as um, as what freedoms are priorities yes uh, would you say that this statement of Kennedy's was the product of a greater cultural shift and this is sort of the, the broad end of the crescendo or would you say it was the beginning of a crescendo of I think it's hard to pinpoint but certainly um, as we see what happened in uh, and certainly in the 1960s and the and the changes that occurred in this country as a result of uh, of the sexual revolution and so many other things that occurred. Uh, was Kennedy the one that let it off? I, I think it would be a, an overstatement to say that. But uh, this is Kennedy's statements, and one of the reasons I wanted to come to a university to talk about it, really um, affected elite institutions and elite in the government. And that while you know, some people may hear this speech and say, well, you know, gee, that's not the way it is in my community. That's probably true. It's probably not the way it is in many communities across America. But it is in the communities that have great impact on our society. It is in the courts. It is in the halls of Congress. It is in the corporate boardroom. It is in, uh, in areas where you know, great influence is, is, uh, is given. And so he was speaking in, in this speech not to that group, but that's who, that's who listened. And... and um, and I think, as a result, have made uh, the participation of believers and, and the offering of, of faith claims uh, much more difficult in America. Thank you. Yes. We had a little bit of an opportunity to begin the conversation before you spoke here this evening uh, over the dinner. But let me pick up a point that you addressed then and just to some extent you addressed it just now. You've alluded to the fact that what you're addressing right now is the, the, the speech that uh, then candidate Kennedy gave, or President Kennedy, and you're, you're po focusing essentially on the limitation of faith in the public sphere, i.e. in government realms. But it seems to me that a much broader limitation, an implicit one, is really an expression, a living out of faith in an articulate, in, an, in, a, in, a, in a penetrating way, in almost all realms of life. It seems that the call would be not only to bring faith into its rightful place in the public square vis-a-vis -vis the political realm, but also in the realm of business, in the, in the boardrooms, as you just mentioned, in the realm of the arts, in the realm of the media, in the realm of most educational institutions, and that in some sense, Christians have been muzzled not by an external force, but by an internal one, by almost a self-muzzling fear. Mm. And also, I would suggest perhaps a lack of fire in the pulpit to say to every follower of Christ, regardless what denomination, you are called personally to be a vessel of his truth, his courage, his healing, and also his love. 
and that if that kind of power were to go out into people's workplaces and into those decisions and into the things that people write and create and broadcast and teach, wouldn't that make a different kind of a country, country for people like you to then rule from Washington? Um, yes. When you can't add anything, you go to the next question. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes, I was curious to know, um, how does Obamacare, in your mind, conflict with your Catholic position? And you had mentioned earlier that partial abortion is a, I can, you know, that, is a, that would be a problem with uh, Catholic catechism, but beyond that, are there any other um, conflicts of interest between those two institutions? Well, let me talk about Obamacare because it also covers the issue of abortion. And, um, you know, under Obamacare, on the, uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services will still have wide latitude as to whether to fund abortions. And um, even though there's an executive order and all these things, um, they are not worth the paper they're printed on, particularly because we have court decisions, again, elite institutions, court, uh, court decisions that say that Comprehensive health services, which is the term, I think the exact term in the, in the, um, uh, in the Obama bill, uh, includes abortion. I mean, we have case law after case law that says under Medicaid, the reason we have to pass every year what's called the Hyde Amendment is because if we didn't pass a Hyde Amendment saying money cannot be spent on this, then the default, even though the Medicaid law doesn't say abortion's covered, the default is abortions are covered. Why? Because the court says abortions must be covered. And so when Ob Ob what Obama did on abortion was, in my opinion, too cute by a half. And I think a lot of the folks who ended up uh, voting for it and saying they had pro-life protections now realize that they were snookered, um, number one. Number two, and I mean, th uh, there's two other issues. One, very briefly, is the whole conscience clause protections. I talked about that in one of the points I alluded to, which is that uh, uh, hospitals and, and others, uh, other healthcare professionals uh, are forced to provide, a pharmacist forced to provide the morning after pill, who's Catholic. Um, and again, and it's back to your question, that's a balancing act that Congress has, has, uh, has weighed on and said that no, they don't have to provide it unless um, there's nobody else that can provide it. So if you're, the only, if you're living in rural Idaho and you're the only pharmacist and that's the only way someone can get this, and if you're carrying that, then you've got to dispense it. Uh, and if there's someone else that can do it and it's not a, a burden on somebody, fine. So, I mean, th that's, uh, to me, one of the, some of the things you, you legitimately have to balance. I think it's, I don't think we should be dispensing them. I think they're unjust. I think it's wrong as an example, but it's legal. We have to obey the law. And uh, so that, that's another example. The third thing in Obamacare, which to me is the one that, in all due respects to a lot of religious leaders in this country who focus on abortion and, and conscience clause protections, under Obamacare as being the big problems. That, to me, those, those two issues pale in comparison to the third. And the third is government-run health care, government control of health care. We need only to look at every other government-controlled health care system in the world, every single one of them. How do they control costs? They ration care. They ration care, and they ration care based on the best bang for your dollars. In other words, we're going to give care. That's why a lot of these socialized medicine systems have great primary care. Great primary, very inexpensive, a lot of bang for your dollar. But they have very horrible cancer treatment care. They have terrible end-stage disease care. They don't treat children with disabilities after they're born. They look at and evaluate the patient based upon the utility of the dollars that the federal government will spend versus the outcome that they're going to get. The rationing of care that we see in and around the world will result in many more deaths than Obamacare will result in abortions. And yet, many in the faith community stayed quiet about it. Uh, in an attempt to try to get a guaranteed benefit. Guaranteed benefits don't mean anything if you can't get care, if they deny you the care because your life is no longer useful. Uh, I am blessed with the, being a daughter, being, having a daughter who's two years old who is a, 
uh, needs a lot of medical care and would be seen by, I am confident, by uh, many in the uh, socialized medicine world as a not a useful life. Um, even in the system we have today, I have to fight for care. Imagine if in, right now when I take my daughter into the hospital, she's a profit center for them. Now, I know that sounds really crude, but you take anybody who walks in the hospital, that's an opportunity for the hospital to profit. On a government-run system, my daughter now becomes a cost center, not a profit center. And they're going to look at her a lot differently. Uh, that's the difference between public medicine and private medicine. I choose private medicine. Well, hi. Thanks to St. Thomas again for another splendid lecture. I really appreciate these programs over here. I want to ask you, what do you really think about, <laughs> about those Baptists in Houston 50 years ago who forced Kennedy into this position? But before I leave the mic, everybody's been waiting for this question. I know they have. Are you in favor of burning those Korans over there? Well, <laughs> uh, thankfully, whatever this pastor's name, I recent, just you know, a few hours ago, has decided he isn't going to do it anymore. So he's decided he's not going to burn the Koran. Uh, having, having said that, uh, I answer that question the same way I answer the question as to whether the imam in New York should build the mosque. Uh, the answer is that he can build a mosque there and the pastor can burn the Koran under, under the laws of this country and under the, the First Amendment. But neither of them should. Um, and um, thankfully the pastor has gained some insight from some source and decided not to do this because he would do great harm. He would do great harm to our country. He would do great harm to our troops. He would do great harm to the principles of the First Amendment that I just talked about. It's about prudence. I talk about prudence here. And um, that is not prudent. And uh, we, you know, we, um, we rely on that. As much as we rely on faith and virtue and freedom, we also rely on the exercise of prudence and the exercise of those rights. Um, and in the mosque, uh, since I brought it up, uh, I hope the imam has learned a lesson from what we saw in Florida, and he would do the right thing, which is to try to accomplish what he says he wants to accomplish. What he says he wants to accomplish is to build understanding and a bridge between America and Islam. Uh, and I think everyone recognizes he's doing anything but that. He has uh, just done the opposite of that. And that as he continues to do so, um, he will do, in my opinion, some real damage. There's a lot of people in America who are very suspicious of what not just the radical Muslims believe, but about, you know, what does everybody else believe? Why aren't they out there speaking against jihadists? Why aren't they being more vocal? I mean, there's, uh, you know, there, there's a concern. And this man is feeding that anxiety. And it's hurting Islam. It's hurting America. It's hurting the, uh, the very difficult balance that we have to strike in America, which gets to the point about, you know, how much do you limit? Well, uh, if, you, if you're out preaching jihad against America and, you know, blowing up buildings, that's not religious tolerance. Nope, you, gotta, you, you draw the line there. But that's the extreme. Where in that spectrum do you draw the line is a tough question and Americans are trying to figure that out and they want to be lenient they want to be as as you know as uh, as receptive to different viewpoints that's our nature that's why this freedom is just I, I think this freedom is just so ingrained in us um, but he's destroying that and that's that's a very dangerous thing he's doing uh, <laughs> what about those Baptist exercise of their faith 50 years ago? What do you think about their position? Um, well, I mean, as far as exercising their faith in what way? To push Kennedy into this position. Well, I'm not too, I'm not going to, I don't want to blame anybody from pushing him into that position. I mean, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, if, if people, look, 
if there is distrust, I just talked about Islam. Distrust comes from the lack of knowledge of what the faith really believes. There are people in this country, I mean, there are many faiths in this country, I don't really know what their beliefs are. And if you're from an area, and I know there are a lot of people in some areas of the country that, you know, back in 1960 didn't know many Catholics and, you know, you know heard things that, you know, my goodness, I can't even imagine what they heard. And so there was suspicion. Now, is it legitimate? Well, no, but, but Kennedy had to, I think, had a, had a, had a reason to address it uh, and, and put that to bed. And he could have and should have without denying his faith and without throwing faith out of the public square. He could have done it and he chose not to. I very much appreciated your, your speech, and I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Um, I, enjoy, I appreciated, in particular, something you said, um, that we are not born with a competent conscience. And I'd kind of like to ask a, a broad question about how you form your conscience. And uh, let me kind of point out what I, what I mean. Um, you say that you disagree with some of the things that, some of the conclusions that the Pope has come to, that the USCCB has uh, come out with. And a critic might say that perhaps as someone like Speaker Pelosi picks and chooses from her faith those things that already cohere with her beliefs, however she has formed them, that perhaps you do as well. And so maybe can you just touch on these moral absolutes that you referred right. to? Right. I, re I referred to the difference between the issues um, that I was highlighting before I got to those issues of prudential judgment, like abortion and um, marriage, things like that. Those are moral absolutes. Those are teachings of the church, teachings in the broader church, that taking innocent human life in the womb is always wrong. Um, and you know, marriage between a man and a woman is marriage. It's what it is. Uh, those are absolutes. Um, there is no room for disagreement. It is what the church teaches. If you choose not to believe that, that's of course your, your will to do it. But then don't say that you're a believer when you don't believe. Um, and the issue of welfare or the war, as I said, uh, government aid to the poor is not a moral absolute. Uh, I could make the argument that government aid to the poor is, in many respects, immoral. Uh, now, you may have a priest or a bishop or a theologian say, well, no, I mean, it's our obligation to care. That's what, the, that's what it says. And, and we, have to, you know, we have to do everything we can, including the government. Um, I would throw back at them the principle of subsidiarity and say that we have an obligation to take care of people at the lowest possible level, that we have an obligation for us personally out of our own faith conviction to care for our brother, not that we should pass this off for somebody else to do for us by paying the tax, that that is a corruption of what, we are, what, uh, what our faith teaches us. And so that isn't, now, you may take the other side of that, and you could be right. As I said, I could be wrong. On these issues, I could be wrong. I freely admit that I could be wrong, but uh, it, is, it is not something that is, um, that is an absolute moral teaching. And so unlike Nancy Pelosi, who treats government aid for the poor as a moral absolute and abortion as, as one of prudential judgment, that is a complete misunderstanding of the faith. Um, it's a, not a misunderstanding, it's a complete, uh, well, she, yeah, she's, com <laughs> I have been really good so far to keep myself out of YouTube, and I'm going to stay right there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I want to go back to something specific. I have practiced medicine for 30 years, and I don't pretend to have the answers. But I will tell you that living in that profit-driven medical system is less than ideal. I agree. And there are many situations where more treatment is less. 
And unfortunately, a profit-driven system doesn't make those judgments of when it's too much and when, it's, and when the waste and the suffering that medicine causes is wrong, morally wrong, financially and in terms of the suffering of the patient and the people taking care of them. So I don't have the answer, but the profit, purely profit-driven system does not handle those subtleties well at all. I, uh, first off, I would agree with you, and I would say, and I would say that everyone who is in this public policy debate on health care would say that the current system we have is far from perfect. Uh, but the basic uh, elements of it are better than going to a government system. The private sector system needs some different incentives included that are currently not there. You mentioned the profit motive. You mentioned the fact of too much care being given. And the reason too much care is given is because in many cases, people don't have any kind of financial governor on what, what is spent. In other words, they have no stake in the game. So when care is given and they don't have to pay for it, it's very easy to say, do more for mom, okay? Do more for grandma. Um, and that is, in my opinion, wrong. I mean, we have to have some control. There has to be some, uh, some balancing of how we allocate resources. And right now we have a system where uh, for the hospital, for the doctor, the more they do, the more they get paid. Now, that's not always the case, by the way, particularly in some of the more managed care plans. That's not the case at all. But it's certainly in the, in the, in the old PPO fee-for-service world, that's what it is. And that's, that is, I won't say as problematic, because I don't think it is as problematic as a government system, but it is a problem and that we need to address. And I've worked on it for years in trying to, make the ins health insurance system an insurance system as opposed to a third-party payer system. An insurance system where you share liability and you share the cost, just like you share the cost of everything else in your life that you have insurance. It's not, you know, you don't have uh, car insurance that, you know, you don't turn your oil change bill into your insurance company, okay? You don't, you don't change even a little fender bender in it these days into an insurance company. You, you turn it in when you total your car. Why? Because it's really expensive if you do it any other way. Well, in some respects, we need to, we need to imp not exactly that, but a system more like that when it comes to healthcare. And I think striking that proper balance is really a challenge if we're successful, and I hope we are, and at some point repealing Obamacare to replace it with something that rationalizes instead of rations care. Well, ra rationing care is not necessarily bad if it's done with evidence that it's the correct care. I mean, there's recent... That's a difference between rationing care with, w for the reasons of limiting because of some, some, uh, uh, some we, bean counting standard as to what a life is, is, is worth, if you will, as opposed to looking at the person individually and saying, look, in this case, sitting down with the family, and I understand families don't always make rational decisions. That's all we, I understand that. But they will make more rational decisions if there's a financial component to the decision. I don't think that's correct. Well, They're we'll, confused. The patients are, are easily, and families are easily moved this direction or that direction in a very emotional situation. Yeah. And having them have to decide something based on money isn't right either. The, one of the biggest travesties, though, is the insurance companies making profits on this whole system. And, of course, that's not discussed yeah, because well, of the I'm, lobbying. I'm, I'm, you're, you're not going to get me, you're not me, you're not going to get me saying profits are bad. I think profits are a good thing. Um, and so, no, I do. I mean, I, I think profits are a good thing. And, you know, you work in the healthcare system, you make a profit. I mean, it's okay. Profit's fine. I mean, it incentivizes people to, to, for excellence and to do things the right way. I, I, uh, I think what we're all pointing out here is there is no perfect solution here. And it's the old saying, you know, capitalism is, who said this, Churchill is the worst system in the history, you know, of this and that, but it's the best. It's the best alternative. And I would say the same thing. You know, these kinds of painful, horrible situations that people are, are involved in, particularly at the end of life, are, and there is, there's never going to be an optimum solution. I mean, we can't expect that, but what we can, what we can do is make it one that uh, gives us the best chance to get the best result.
Senator Santorum, thank you for an excellent, very thought-provoking presentation. It was thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, it, it's uh, become increasingly clear that the current administration is uh, kind of um, engaging a very surreptitious change of language in reference to the freedom of religion, namely uh, a very truncated, I think, uh, phrase, freedom. freedom of worship. Worship, yeah. My, my, my question for you is, is, what do you make of this, I guess? What are your thoughts on this? Is this a deliberate uh, move that could actually gain traction in the political sphere such that it will limit um, the actual freedom of religion uh, to this truncated vision of only worship? Yeah, th this is a very important distinction uh, that I, when I was in the Congress, I led a working group on religious liberty, and, and so we, this issue is an issue that you see in a lot of countries around the world where, um, particularly some of the more repressive regimes, where they allow a freedom of worship, but they don't allow freedom of conscience. They don't allow freedom to, you, to, to live out your faith. Uh, so you can go to a service, but that's about it. And, um, and that is a limitation on the freedom of religion, but it sounds like it. That's the, that's the beauty of the term. It's just, it's not a freedom of worship. Oh, we get, you know, that's great. I mean, they can go and worship. Um, but it's not freedom of conscience. And, um, you know, you have, for example, in China, uh, you have state churches and you have all these things that, uh, that look like religious freedom, but it's not religious freedom. And we have to be very careful not to be like them. And that's what you, you hear out of the State Department, which, which it unfortunately is a very secular institution. And, um, and, and I think understands this completely when they, when, you hear Hillary Clinton, I think, was the one who used the term freedom of worship. She understands completely what she was saying, which is dangerous, I mean, which is scary. One quick follow-up. Yeah. What about in terms of the courts, in terms of entering the language of the courts, which I think would be the, uh, the biggest travesty? Yeah, we have to, that, look, uh, it, only, it only takes one decision. Yeah. It takes one judge who decides he's going to do something really out of the box, probably in the Ninth Circuit, and, uh, or, you know, and, and as we saw just recently in a district court in San Francisco, and so they're just going to come up with something, and people will laugh about it and say, oh, this is crazy, you know, we, you know this is it's one of these bizarre decisions, and then someone will reference it, and then someone else will reference it, and there'll be a law review article on it, and uh, this is how things build. So why academia is so important when you have some of these uh, crazy academics who come up with these bizarre theories and people laugh at them and say, you know, this is crazy. And then some judge finds it and uses it. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, we've, we've now, you know, contaminated further the, uh, the judicial system in our country. So I do not, I, I'm not going to make any predictions about when, but you will see it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Senator Santorum. Um, I'm a physician, and I'd like to offer another perspective about profits. Profits are good, because we, let's not confuse the ends, the means. Profits are the means. The ends is to fund philanthropy uh, for universities, to help people in Pakistan. If the United States is poor, the United States would not be able to help anybody else throughout the world. So profits are good. Earn your all you can, and give all you can. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, uh, and my question, yeah, my question to you okay. is this, am I, am I understanding correctly is that you're under the non-governmental uh, health care, don't you take into account not only profits, but also the freedom of the practitioners, the freedom of patients, all factors come into play to, 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 to bring health care to fruition, not just uh, 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 um, um, Well, the, the, the question on, under government medicine is how prescriptive it will be. And, exactly. and I think you see with these boards and commissions that have been set up, the incentives that were in the bill, that if you're a doctor and you're a top 10 utilization, uh, you know, you get, you get your fees whacked, uh, you get your reimbursements whacked, What's that going to tell the physician community to do? It, they, it creates incentives. Uh, anytime you see these kinds of incentives to save money, 
uh, you see medicine, the practice of medicine changing. And now that happens in the private sector, but you have choices in the private sector. Um, you can go to another insurance company. You can complain to your insurance company. You can complain to your member of Congress. When the government eventually, as it will, if Obamacare is, fu is fully implemented, takes over the uh, provision of health care and what's covered and what's not and how it's going to be covered and who's going to be reimbursed and why and, and under what circumstances, you have no recourse. And, and, and as a result, you, you see um, systems where you have socialized medicine, you see uh, these incentive systems to save cost result in, um, in people getting inappropriate care. And uh, you see it particularly with people who are sick not getting the treatments they need. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure how long we're going to be allowed to go, so I'll try to make my question very uh, short. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for a, uh, a reflective, and it seemed to me a, a, a deep reflection on this uh, issue that you're concerned with of uh, religion and public life. Um, uh, Plato uh, thought about people he called philosopher kings, and you don't see too many politicians who even come close to his conception. I, I still consider myself a philosopher surf. Yes, I understand. <laughs> but I want to ask you a question that I think um, um, comes out of your concern, uh, and it's my concern. If um, John F. Kennedy was a, a truly religious man, but he made a political decision to sort of discount his religion in public policy. I'd like to ask you, what kind of road have we traveled if President Obama is not at all a religious man, but presented himself for election as a man of religion, which is what appears to me to be the case? Uh, you know, you know, America is a very faith-filled country. I talked about that at the end of the speech, that you know, we are remarkably resistant to, have been historically remarkably resistant to the, to the movement of secularism that has, I was just in Europe a couple weeks ago and met with a group of parliamentarians there. And uh, just to listen to the horror stories about uh, what life is like in, uh, in, in governing these countries and just the rampant secularism that uh, that they have, and you know we we have not succumbed to that. We are still, you know, I I knew that this was a statistic I, I used to say a few years ago. I don't know if it's still true, but you know more Americans go to church on Sunday than to all the professional sporting events uh, that occur in America in an entire year. I mean that's just a remarkable thing to think about. I mean it's uh, we you know lots of people go to church. And it's, it's, an, it's an important part of who we are, and politicians know that. So it's, it's very unusual that you'd see a, a politician being hostile, openly hostile to people of faith. So they're covertly hostile to people of faith, <laughs> which is what, what I discussed here today. And so uh, in the case of Barack Obama, um, you know, he joined a church. Uh, the church just so happened to be a church that was a very big mega church that was politically powerful in the area that he happened to want to run for election. Now, maybe that was a coincidence. I don't know. Uh, and, and he attended that church for many years, but according to him as he ran for president, he never heard any of the things that were said in that church. So uh, I don't know. I mean, you, you, I, I, look, I, I'm being facetious here, but it, it, the American public is smart enough to figure this out. Uh, they're going to see, um, and in the beginning, you know, look, I mean, the, the president was, got a, got a great, um, um, a great start by, with the media giving him pretty much the royal treatment. Um, that's now changing, and people are going to be able to see what the real man is and what he really believes and who he is, and uh, they'll make their decision the next time he's up. Yes. Senator, uh, I know that you have a 100% pro-life voting record. 
and I thank you for that. Thank you for looking out for the babies in the womb. But I can tell you that there are many pro-lifers who think that you have sold the babies out when you, uh, uh, when you and uh, President George W. Bush supported the re-election re campaign of Arlen Specter. Now, what should our response be to those people when they tell us they feel that way? Um, you know, what I talked about here in this speech, um, and I was asked a question about this, the difference between moral absolutes and prudential judgments. Um, the supporting of a candidate or not is in no faith tradition a moral absolute. It's not. I mean, it can't be. Um, and so what you have to look at is you use your prudential judgment to make a decision that you think is in the best interest of the things that you care about. Um, and what I did in that case was to make a prudential judgment. I say to people all the time, um, if you disagree with the judgment that President Bush and I made, you would be with my wife on that. And um, <laughs> you would be with some of my closest friends on that. Um, but all I can tell you is I did so out of an, a sincere obligation to try to advance the causes, particularly this cause, that you and I cared so deeply about. And I say that, uh, which sounds somewhat counterintuitive, but I say that in that uh, the most important thing that the next Congress was going to deal with, and we were at a 51-49 majority at the time, the President was up for re-election, and we had one, two, and maybe three Supreme Court justices that were going to be filled in the first couple of years of the next term. And with a 51-49 majority, I knew that if we did not have a majority, if the Democrats controlled the United States Senate, the President would not be able to nominate a strong candidate and get them confirmed. So we needed to have every Republican we could, and in particular, Arlen Specter, who would have been and became the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, was going to be a key player either way. Why? because he is the linchpin for not just moderate Republicans to vote for judges, but also moderate Democrats to vote for judges. And if Specter says it's okay, then we get votes to pass these justices. Um, both President Bush and I uh, understood that, and we were able to secure commitments out of Senator Specter that if he were successfully elected and served as chairman of the committee, he would support the president's nominees. Now, uh, what I've said to people is you can be critical of me on a lot of issues with respect to supporting Arlen Specter. You can say, you know, he's bad on a whole host of issues, far too numerous for me to mention here tonight. But the issue that, and you can be critical that I supported him because he was going to be on the wrong side. I would argue that the one issue that is not legitimate for you to criticize me on is the issue of life. Because on the most important issue of life, I made a political sacrifice because the most common question I get anywhere I go is not how are you, but why did you support Arlen Specter? Uh, and so I knew that. I mean, trust me, I knew that. Uh, and yet I felt strongly enough that the Supreme Court was worth the sacrifice. I suspected that would be your answer. Thank you. Last question here, It's very bold of you to say last question when there's nobody else at the microphones, but that's... Uh... Uh, oh, my. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for speaking to us, Senator. I was intending to start my question with a reference to those that plan to burn those Korans and the, and the plan to build the Ground Zero Mosque, okay. but it looks like the man in the orange shirt took care of that. Right. <laughs> so, I would like to turn my thoughts to someone by the name of Robert Riley, who recently wrote a book called The Closing of the Muslim Mind, yeah. in which he argued that two 
who factions within Islam battled a thousand years ago over the role of reason, reason and yeah. defining faith, and unfortunately, the side that favored pure will and power won over the side that favored reason, which I think Faisal Abdul Rauf's insistence on building the mosque might be consistent with that, but you might disagree. Okay, how I would answer that is, number one, there was a battle. So in Islam are roots of reason. They lost. Bob Riley's book, and I know Bob well, he's a good man. He used to work at the State Department, one of the few good men at the State Department. <laughs> uh, and Bob, um, Bob's book is, is a, in my opinion, a must read for people to understand uh, this debate that occurred, not just by the way, and I hate to, uh, to say this and because I'm a member, I'm a philosopher serf here, not a, not a king, but you know, there was a, 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 another debate within Christianity as to whether God was all good or all powerful. And, and uh, you know, we came down differently than the Muslims did at the time. They came down and said that God is all powerful. And, and as a result, can do both good and evil, and we cannot judge him, that he is beyond reason. Okay. And um, thanks to some of the great philosophers of the, of the day, uh, we came down with a different decision. Uh, Christianity came down with a dis different decision, and so the roots are different. But I keep going back to the hope that Islam can regain its earlier roots, mm. where reason was um, that there were legitimate scholars within Islam that argued a different idea. And hopefully, um, to get back, if you know, a lot of the jihadists say we're getting back to the original test, to the original meaning, all this kind of stuff. Well, let's try to get back to the original discussion. It, again, not unanimously held, but that reason that God is a God of reason and is limited himself to do just good uh, as opposed to can do whatever he wants because he is all-knowing and we cannot know him. Well, to follow it up, I've been reading several articles and texts by people like Walter Russell Mead and Alan Hertzke featuring the role of religious figures in building a human rights, co a greater coalition for human rights. Factoring in your speech and this Taking what you said in this speech and these articles together, what policy recommendations would you give to President Obama regarding religious liberty? Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, uh, what policy recommendations would I give him? That I think I laid out uh, pretty clearly here how I would like to see you know, faith treated in the public square and um, how every politician should, should welcome people of faith and, and, um, and, and how important this, this sacred realm, if you will, is to moving our country to more just society, that it is not a threat, but that it is, um, it is that conscience, that real conscience for, for our society. So, uh, you know, um, I don't know what particular things that you want me to uh, to discuss, but I think that's the general gist of what I would refer say. It's okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was perfect. Very well done. Very well done. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you.